Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 106th New Social Environment. Uh, I'm Malvika Jolly, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a extra special conversation between Shazia Sikander and Jason Rosenfeld. We're also thrilled to have the poet Zachary Lamalfa here as an extra special treat who will read to close today's program. So looking forward to that, Zach. And now to introduce today's host, Jason Rosenfeld is a distinguished chair and professor of art history at Marymount Manhattan College. He was co-curator of a variety of exhibitions, some of which are John Everett Millais at the Tate Britain and at the Van Gogh Museum, Pre-Raphaelites Victorian Avant-Garde, also at Tate Britain and the National Gallery of Art in DC, and River Crossings, um, which was installed at Hudson and Catskills. He has contributed the lead text for a faded monograph on Cecily Brown that will be published in November of this year. So looking forward to that. Finally, Jason is a senior writer and beloved editor at large for The Rail. Jason, take it away. Thank you so much, Malvika. Um, welcome everyone to uh, the first new social environment in the Kamala Harris era and our 106th, as we mentioned. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Malvika and the rest of the Rail team, you know who you are, uh, for your support and uh, working in the background to make all these go smoothly, and Fong for his uh, intrepid leadership. Uh, also Adair Lentini and Alyssa Kalura at Sean Kelly, who have been very helpful today. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Shaiza, who, Shaiza, Sh Shazia, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> who um, is, uh, is uh, willing to hang out with us today and is, uh, her wonderful art is gonna be on display and also her state of mind, which you will enjoy. Um, and we're gonna talk through her career and her present work and some public art that she's been doing uh, around the country and elsewhere. Um, she is an artist who uh, does not really need an extensive introduction, very well known uh, and very accomplished. She was born in Lahore in Pakistan in 1969. Uh, she lived in Somalia for a bit in the early 1980s and then attended back in Pakistan, the high school at the convent of Jesus and Mary. Um, in, and then in 1985, the Kinnaird College for Women, studying math, economics, and literature in Lahore. And she earned a BFA at the National College of Arts in Lahore, and she studied with Bashir Ahmed, um, began her studies in 1986-1987, was teaching by 1992, and we'll show you some works from that period. In 1993, she came to Washington, D.C. to show her work at the Pakistani Embassy, um, and uh, she didn't leave. Uh, she's been here essentially ever since. Um, she earned an MFA at uh, the Rhode Island School of Design, which we will refer to henceforth as RISD, um, and it, that was in 1995. And then, um, like any good visitor to America, she'd gotten a small car, I think it was a Hyundai, uh, which is the exact kind of car that I first drove cross country, <laughs> drove south to uh, Houston, to uh, work in a core residency program of the Glassell School of Art in Houston, uh, rooming with uh, Nicola Constantino, who's an Argentine artist. And she was teaching and working with the African-American community in Houston. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then in 1996, she had a seminal visit to New York City. And in 97, the next year she had, uh, was part of a group show at the Drawing Center downtown. And in 1997 also had work in the Whitney Biennial, showed at Deech Projects in 1998 uh, in Soho. And uh, since then it's been a rocket like trajectory, which we will get into at length. She has been awarded the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award. She also uh, got a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in 2006. She has been artist in residence uh, all over the planet it seems. And she's done some wonderful uh, programs, which I encourage you to seek out for PBS's great series, Art 21. There are a couple episodes on her, but there are also some where she is kind of like the Robert Hughes of the contemporary art world and is out at um, art fairs uh, in the UAE and uh, also um, in Turkey and showing you contemporary artists from all over the globe. They're terrific. So you should check them out if you can. So uh, welcome to the rail. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, 
Jason, I am so honored to be here to be part of this incredible series and um, thank you, Brooklyn Rail. So fantastic. Let's get right into it. So we're going to show you some of her work and talk about her, um, her career. So one second. Everybody should be able to see the images now. Yeah, I'm glad I'm not doing this. So thank you. <laughs> so we got to, we have to go through a pleasurably go through a sort of potted history of your career to introduce people to what you have been doing uh, since the 1980s and since your remarkable early work when you were a teenager um, studying at the uh, studying at the um, National College of Arts in Lahore, which was uh, and is a co-ed institution um, and uh, the impact of miniatures on your early style. So on the left in the screen, you can see, and everyone can look at my cursor, some early work from 1987 to 1988. And on the right, a work that um, Shazia shared with me of the Nightmare of Zahak, uh, which is a um, uh, illuminated manuscript, a, a manuscript a miniature, uh, which is now in the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha. Yeah, I'm glad we're showing that because um, the provenance of this manuscript is so interesting um, that, you know, that's been really part of the way I have um, engaged with miniature painting over now three decades is to really look at the, um, hit the, the sort of geographies and histories of, uh, of how canons um, get developed and get um, determined. And majority of the miniature painting um, also resides in storages in institutions, mostly in Western institutions. Definitely growing up in Pakistan in 19, you know, in, in the 80s, oh, one didn't grow going into, uh, in, into a culture of, of um, museums or having access to a, a lot of the art that I've had once I've been able to have mobility and travel and, and have access to these collections. So that's also a very pertinent aspect of, of my um, interest in the medium itself and the genre is understanding who gets to write about it, who gets to determine it's, it and where um, it's all about the archives, right? It's like, so, so much of the archives are unpublished. So when they're unpublished, they're basically invisible. And that idea of visibility and invisibility in terms of representation. So, sorry, maybe too much here, yeah, but definitely. No, but I, it's um, true. Right, and, and wasn't the first sort of real exposure that you had to it was a lecture actually from 1998, someone who came to school from the V&A, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London that kind of encapsulates the whole idea of who's writing these histories of art in your own culture. Yeah, totally. That, of course, it's like, you know, the colonial history of the region is, is, is several hundred years. Mm. It's, uh, it, and also to understand that um, it, the art school itself has a very interesting history uh, Kipling being one of the early presidents and then the industriousness of the of the craft and this sort of British experiment with uh, uh, recognizing, you know, kind of the craft based works and putting them in the curriculum. So, so my encounter with miniature painting at that particular moment in time in 1986 is um, the context for that is that I wasn't really going intended to go to an art school. I was uh, definitely uh, uh, interested in understanding who my community would be, where at that time during military dictatorship, Zhao Huck's period, uh, I think I, I was gravitating towards humanities and I was interested in, in finding ways which, you know, which intersected with community and dissent and expression and, one of the early mentors was also a um, the late artist Lala Roh, who I worked with um, while I was still a high school student 
and who encouraged me to go to the art school. Hmm. And it's also because, um, you know, I was good at drawing. So it was one of the, one of the things that came naturally to me. So it made sense to be able to find ways to explore a language that I could communicate in, mm -hmm. uh, in a more efficient manner. But then, you know, then this encounter with, with this so-called tradition sort of ours, it was, it was incredibly fascinating because for me, it was also, I didn't know much about it. And then at the same time, I was quest I wanted to understand like who determines what is tradition, especially when, when in this sort of position of tradition versus the avant-garde, and right. and if and if and if so-called tradition was derivative and uh, something that you know uh, did not allow a young generation of artists to uh, take it on as a as a language as a as an idiom as a medium of expression then. Uh, than all the dynamics of that particular situation. I also find it really interesting that you talk in other interviews um, about how your access to these original works was very limited. Um, the like masterpieces like this one from the Sahavid Empire was really limited in, in Pakistan. And I wonder, you know, you were looking at them in black and white and reproductions and then not really yeah. in full till you got to America? Yeah, like the majority of my exp exposure to it is a handful of books at that time mm -hmm. passed on by um, either teachers or the ones which were at the library, not necessarily, and a few of some, some miniature paintings which were at the Lahore Art Museum. But this particular um, example, for example, uh, is the Persian Safavid period. And this this one, the Shah Tamast, Shah Name, is a very significant, iconic work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here also, you can understand that um, how it remained intact as a volume till I think the 70s into the 60s. There's a great article uh, on its provenance. And I think that kind of gives you a good insight into what happens in the 70s when it's broken apart and separate folios are put into the market and at that time you know if you can you imagine like the integrity of certain um, artworks of certain cultures mm -hmm. is if you look at if you understand it from that perspective like how how much of that would happen to significant work, works in the western canon in the Western historical canon. So that kind of, you, it's the stories of destruction for me. It's mm. also like the Western trade. It's also the art market. It's also how uh, the, the Shanami then uh, is bought by, I think, Houghton in the, in, in, uh, from the Rothschilds in Paris to Houghton and then dispersed and in the market uh, of, I think, 10 folios, some of the best ones also were purchased at, by the Aga Khan, or the, uh, now at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. And I bring it up because I am um, developing a new project for the next year or two, uh, looking at the provenance and also looking at, yeah. at the Shah Name itself and developing it with, uh, with the Aga Khan Museum. It's interesting, it's this sort of savaging of indigenous arts by wealthy Western powers. I mean, it's not that much different from what people like Bernard Berenson were doing and other collectors in the late 19th, early 20th century to Italian altarpieces in small towns and breaking them up and selling them off on the market. A similar kind of sort of tale. Yeah, of uh, this sort of cannibalizing, right? Yeah. That happens. Yeah. And then I think what, what how it gets um, that particular Shahnameh story is so interesting because then it's kind of bartered with the, um, with the modern art museum, um, the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art in Iran and in exchange for a de Kooning, hmm. which ends up with Def David Geffen's collection. Hmm. And um, the whole exchange takes place in, in I think in uh, Vienna. And that it's so like, it's like a, 
it's right it's sort of a story a very detective story it could yeah. you could definitely make it into a film it's like mission think, impossible stuff absolutely so like you know so when when you start digging deeper and looking at at some of the histories then it, it then you cannot talk for me it's impossible to be just engaging with miniature painting from like this presumption that it is culturally Pakistani mm. or that anything that I'm doing within it is autobiographical. Uh, so for a long time, I think in the early years when my work was getting attention, that was the incredible sort of constant frustration that it got straight jacketed in terms of one's biography. Mm -hmm. And whether at that time in the 90s, you know, the operable lenses were about identity, whatever. But still, I think the, the, this idea of somebody from another culture and thus being the other, then let's just contain or relegate that notion within you know, a culturally specific work that in the West seems uh, safe. That, okay, here's somebody that does this type of practice. This yeah. must be the prevalent language in a particular culture. And I think at that time, it was like this constant battle that whether should I just let go and not work in this medium. But at the same time, I felt like I also needed to continue the dialogue that I'd already started in Pakistan. So, so that's a time, you know, pre, yeah, pre-internet a long time ago. <laughs> right. It's interesting that yeah. from the Western perspective, it was perceived as something which was uh, canonical and sort of traditional and obvious for a Pakistani artist to do. But from the, your perspective, working and living in Pakistan, it was a radical practice to take this, uh, you know, gambit to work under uh, uh, professors who were doing works in, a, in the miniature style, but in a traditional style, kind of like, I think of it like um, contemporary icon painter for uh, Eastern church, Byzantine churches, continue to make icons in the form of, uh, you know, Russian and, uh, and uh, 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 Crimean region icons, Ukrainian icons from the past. Um, but that in fact, this was your gambit in Pakistan was a radical one, subversive in a sense. And when but, it comes to a work like Scroll, uh, which we're going to look at, you know, which is sort of one of the breakthrough works, um, it really goes against contemporary practice. Yeah, I think in terms of having, you know, exploring the language and being able to inject it with with new iconographies and developing like a relationship with it that of course is a process for every artist yeah. but i think what at that particular time what was interesting was that miniature painting itself was had deep stigma attached to it yeah. it was seen as something you know again derivative and not necessarily a language capable of of uh, moving forth like ideas at, a, at that faster rate and I think for a lot of those things were problematic for me too, especially as a young person, like you had to devote like 14 hours or so. I would, I would, I, I worked in, at that sort of frenzy at that scale with such labor intensive work for years. So you, I wasn't able to engage in anything in addition. It was really a dedication mm. and that, was always very clear in my mind that that was not going to suddenly make me a traditional artist. I was interested in this performa performative notion of what is tradition? Where in time and scale do you determine certain works as being traditional and, and when, when does that shift and change? And also at the, at the kind of armature and history of, of the colonial re res residue in terms of other types of education also, you know, you're thinking, you're engaging like language too, English and Urdu and that complicated relationship. My generation, I'm speaking for myself, but there was a whole emphasis on, on English at the detriment of learning Urdu. So my spoken Urdu aside, but my ling uh, Urdu skills for Urdu literature and Urdu poetry are are terrible. So the, this you have to see in terms, for me that, that became interesting, like miniature painting was a means of learning a language. And, as, and I was gonna speak in that language, but I had to acquire that language that's sort of very pragmatic, 
interested in in an analytical approach and um, also historical, but since it was the only way for me to embrace it and understand it was through studio practice, because the only person at that time involved in teaching it was Bashir Ahmed. So I had to take on the, take it on as a, as a studio course. And thus yeah. that started the journey. And I, you know, kind of sort of like, it was more like a, a apprenticeship model. So then, yes, so the scroll, these are some, this work is a, a, a exper like I was doing painting. It was my minor major was miniature painting. And so I'm like exploring ideas, mediums, um, you know, sizes, too, sizes, scale. all. Note how big this is. It's at eight, that early five. age, at that early stage, yeah. because all of that experiment was allowing me to open up the boundaries and the so-called confinements that came along with mm. how one was going to understand or deconstruct or disassemble yeah. one's very limited understanding at that time of, of the canon of miniature painting. Yeah. And it's interesting that you did designs and collage on a large scale and then made these scrolls, which are not small. They're a little over a foot high. They're long, uh, but you know, the, the, there's a, a quality, a minute quality to them per the miniature tradition in terms of application of medium. Yeah, absolutely. So it was also like, you know, the early work that we were looking at, the Safavid period. So I was interested, that became like a very um, um, kind of a muse for me. So I was mm. looking at the um, interiority of space and how the internal physical um, expression of space uh, operates in the Safavid um, period and then sort of opening up the boundaries of the home. So this idea of a, of a, of a, of a space, but I think also logically during that time there it is uh, women's rights are being limited. There are ordinances that limit women's physical movement in, in and out of the city, the Hadood ordinances. So, you know, at that age, I was pretty much going to be in indoors. So this sort of separation between physical and um, the, the private and public spaces was getting polarized. And so I thought it made sense to then situate the work in the space that I was going to spend majority of my time. So that's where I became interested in, in, the, in the language of architecture, yeah. look, sort of looking at contemporary Pakistani architects, Nayar Ali Dada, and then finding echoes in his work with the Safavid depiction of space. And then sort of the protagonist in this particular painting is this sort of diaphanous, you know, um, figure, which could be, which is pr probably myself, but at that time it is this yearning it's the female protagonist who is also upending the fetishized uh, sort of virtuous figure of the very static woman in most of the older miniatures that i was learning to read and recognize again mm. some of the descriptions are coming from western historians so some of the catalogs and books but it was always the static figure that that kind of um made the woman either she's awaiting an event that she has no control over. So hmm. avaid, aw awaiting the lover or awaiting, you know, a, a, another kind of action. So this sort of dormant notion of the figure, I wanted to disrupt that. And here it's like the flexibility of the form. It's, uh, it's kind of very transient and it also defies bodily movement, so to speak. So it's sort of, you know, a rupture away from the very patriarchal um, patterns. At the um, National College of, of Art, did you have to, uh, were, they, were you taught how to draw in perspective using orthogonals and, you know, traditional ways of seeing from the Western canon? Oh yeah. Um, if less, maybe yes, all of that is there. See, it's like already has a history of an English yeah. uh, schooling system. So you did all of that, like you had your um, uh, painting classes, studying landscapes, still life, sort of sculpture, plaster of Paris sculpture. I remember, you know, different, all of that 
it wasn't that different from say even like later RISD. Yeah. But um, what I thought ha there was a big shift, like kind of problematic uh, space was that when we studied art history, for example, art through the ages, the big art through the ages book. Mm, Gardner, you yeah, know. the textbook. <laughs> yeah. So th at that time, definitely at my time, there were no special courses that talked about South Asian contemporary art mm. or in-depth uh, Pakistani um, um, history of visual art. You knew here and there, but never really. So like oftentimes when you studied art through the ages, it was so outside of your own ex experience. Right. That, um, you know, much of it was forgotten for me. Right. I find it really interesting just looking at this as someone who was trained on Western art and looking at scroll, which was, you know, sort of exploded on the scene in 1990 as something you know, really extraordinary and, and kind of put you on the map as, you know, something that reminds me of, and this is not to talk about influence because we're not, we're not interested in that really, but reminds me of Lorenzetti's frescoes in Siena at the Palazzo Publico and artists who are trying to work out perspective in a Brunelleschian sense, which hadn't been sort of reinvented yet. But I find it really interesting the way that you're, you know, it, it seems consciously trying to deny that kind of perspective, right? To, and that in some sense is following along the kind of perspectival language or reverse per perspectival language of the miniatures from the past, from uh, centuries earlier, but also a kind of attempt to, you know, willfully go against those traditions of depth. And I, and I think that's something that hopefully we can talk about as we go today and even look at in your videos. I think the way that you're able to keep things on the frontal plane and to and it's not about a kind of modernist flatness but it's about a kind of presentness making these things really vivid in the face of the viewer and denying a sort of depth and even in the videos it's remarkable to me in the films how it, depth is really difficult to perceive and i think that it, it seems to me as something that is going on here an attempt to deny that entirely yeah i i think that's so correct because i think some of the tools that were being taught at that time or discussed were about, um, you know, taking photographic references. Mm -hmm. And that was one way of contemporizing the traditional miniature. And for me, that was not interest that interesting. I wanted to like go further back in history and that thus sort of draw a bridge to the Safavid period, for example, and reclaim that space and not necessarily be tempted to just you know, mimic photographic ventures and and uh, and change the the perspective because mm -hmm. that would be considered contemporary. Even in terms of themes, like the themes of you know contemporary home life or festivals, etc., that seemed like very staged events. I was more interested in in more abstract notions of how to inject abstraction, not literally in terms of like the language but also conceptually, how the ambiguity of youth, how the sort of, you know, what I was experienced at an emotional level, how could I inject the emotionality into the miniature? And that's where, where definitely the pre what you're pointing out, the presence, the present moment, like every, all types of action and everything can be experienced and viewed simultaneously and not necessarily in some type of hierarchy. Like that was, that was really the, the idea of the scroll itself, though it unscrolls, but it could be a day right. in one's life. It could be the lifetime. It could be a cross section of a home. It could be countless homes. It yeah. can also be the domestic kind of charged domestic space, domestic labor, class stratification that are all, all these sort of elements are there being um, put, put in, activated through various sort of strategies and layers. Right. And that's sort of, you know, I was pretty young when I was doing that. Yeah, amazing, really, 19. And there's this beautiful quality of time and I find it very cinematic the way that you've treated this, as you mentioned before, that sometimes the figure is quite corporeal and opaque 
and sometimes she becomes translucent and it's a sort of cinematic effect of that figure sort of vanishing or coming into vision and collapsing time. It's, it's a remarkable work. What is the medium in the scroll? You know, it's water-based. It's, yeah. you would say like, yeah, watercolor gouache. Right. Huh. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the, that was really the, the, one of the, I think that the pressure that I had was that I had to make a very compelling case in my thesis hmm. that though I was going to experiment, but I was going to remain true to the language of miniature. Mm -hmm. So everything had to be, you know, like I had to really be good at the, at the technical level as well. And so the stakes were pretty high. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I think that's, that's where the, 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 the scroll itself becomes such a breakthrough is that it, um, it got so much national attention. So this is before even coming to the U.S., right? Yeah. So, locally. so, so when I started to teach there in 1992, at that time, I was the first person to have taught alongside the master teacher Bashir Ahmed, and um, the first female in the entire history of of whatever history. You know, it's a very different history, but it's an interesting history a topic of conversation for another day. But mm -hmm. Bashir Ahmed talks about it. Um, at length, and we actually, in my upcoming uh, monograph uh, with uh, with RISD, we do have a chapter in there where he gets to speak about uh, his contribution and how he comes to teach miniature painting at the National College of Art. Right. I should mention that monograph is part of an exhibition that will be opening at the Morgan Library uh, in New York City in June of next year, 2021, and then we'll travel to Providence in uh, Rhode Island to RISD and then to the MFA in Houston. So we're really looking forward to that show. So works that come following that uh, are d done, I guess, uh, and through you know, after your work or during your work at RISD as a grad student. Yeah, there, there's obviously, you know, it's, it's, it was the whole story of how I come to the US. It's also very interesting, but again, pre-internet, a totally different world, very few scholarships available to study mm. art. Definitely no scholars. So I was, I was hunger. I had hunger to travel, to experience, you know, to put myself in new experiences. And I uh, ended up in the U.S. not because I wanted to go to an art school to the U.S. It was just the way I actually came for an exhibition at the Pakistani Embassy in Washington D.C. And uh, the, the show was literally tied to a Pakistani event on the 23rd of March. And it was for a day. And I, I had all these, like I had more than small, like 40 works, small works. And um, you know, none of them sold. I was so lucky. Like I think at that time they were all under like 20 bucks or four, $50. And uh, major people who came to that event were expats. Pakistani community, mostly in, 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 in and around Washington, D.C., but lucky, lucky for me that all that work existed and I was able to take that work in person and call up some schools and, you know, and that's how I ended up meeting Dennis Congdon, at the, who was the painting head and then the department head at the Rhode Island School of Design. I met many other um, art schools, Art Institute in Boston and Maryland and Art Institute Chicago, but somewhere, somehow, it was like RISD um, spoke to me. And I think obviously because Dennis was, you know, it was great to meet somebody who wanted to engage about the work. Mm. So it wasn't like, you know, just a phone call and then no conversation. So, so that's so At RISD, I, I, this is the sixth of these that I've done. And the first with an artist who's trained in America, not at Yale. So it's refreshing. And maybe you <laughs> might talk a little bit about, you know, the kind of atmosphere at RISD for an international student like yourself in the 1993. And also, was there a kind of group idea? I mean, did, did, did you meet people who are uh, giving a sense of a kind of RISD style or approach to art, which, uh, you know, we have a, always have art students who are listening to these talks. And I think it'd be quite interesting for them to hear about that. Yeah. 
So, you know, yeah, my, my, my understanding of RISD from an outsider perspective, the first I remember instinct I had was like, there was a little bit of Asian representation. And, you know, interestingly at that time, it was mostly in, in, in design and in fashion, it was East Asian, not necessarily South Asian. So, you know, already the, in the first visit to the US, one could tell that the country was, it was all the dynamic is between black and white. And then in between, you know, our being brown or Asian is like this very vast category mm. that you're gonna be lumped into. And what does that mean? Like, so, so I was like, oh, well, at least there at, at RISD, there is a little bit of a internationalism, international sort of notion of, of the international artists. And, and, and I think a little bit of that. And then I thought I would study illustration because that's something that was coming up often in terms of how people were perceiving my work. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is me just visiting RISD at that time. I didn't yet have a, um, uh, I, I wasn't in the school. I hadn't even applied. So, um, so yes, yeah. so once I was able to get in, which of course was because I had all this work to show, so it kind of facilitated all of that. And it's a different time, you know, in 92, art schools were still fairly, weren't that expensive. My big issue was that I had to get financial aid and I ended up sitting in the library in Chicago guided by somebody at the Art Institute, came across a book, read, read many different artist residencies, and there was a women's chapterhood all across the country. But I think in I, uh, Des Moines, um, it had their uh, main center and I applied and I was able to get tuition for three semesters. Huh. And um, this is a time when it was like you, there was money available for international, grad, for international graduate women on the premise that it would either become a loan or you would, you would put into application whatever you were learning. And if you had good grounds that you were going to put it into application, then the loan would be, you know, would, would, would be forgiven. So it's, it's this weird intersection of like, you know, me wanting to engage in art because that's what I know. But at the same time, it's, um, I, I'm like, you know, the fodder for my work is really how to find means of, of uh, um, the, the, the culture that I'm experiencing. Mm. how art intersects, you know, in terms of becoming resourceful, becoming, finding ways financially too, to engage, to find ways to, to allow myself to be able to plunge into the MFA. And what that meant was like, how could I then get a student visa mm. from, a, from a visitor's visa? You know, every, every little aspect had its, it had, it had a larger context that, that, it, that art intersected with your lived experience, with your life, and simultaneously both were affecting each other. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these early works of reinventing the dislocation, or I think the other one, like the um, pleasing dislocation are all from the perspective of sure. not necessarily sort of me um, having come to the US no. as a as a child of a immigrant, right? Yeah, no. here's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of I came there by choice. Yeah. So it's not like my parents were there and that so like I was trying to understand what the South Asian diaspora and the politics of that were and how at that time I didn't feel as if I belonged to it because I was still pretty much, you know, an outsider. And yeah. at the same time, you know, America, American foreign policy around the world, but American foreign policy and its presence in, in the Afghan, Pak, US, Soviet war in Northern, in Afghanistan, Northern Pakistan, like as, as a citizen of Pakistan, you, you, you 
grew up in with that in the background in the 80s mm. right so that was influencing me you can't you couldn't just be like see the geographies without also keeping like a lens of 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 the of the identity of the pakistani identity it, many americans may not have understood that because you know many americans don't travel like from at that time encountering so many people that would that had never even gone to outside of the us or would have traveled right. to a muslim muslim culture or country right so that becomes kind of interesting that what is this who is the other the very limited viewpoints of the other if i'm if i was going to be the other through this polarizing premise of east west then the response that was happening in my work was that i started to engage with the human body and the you know it get the forms get a uh, very sort of monstrous the female figure is monstrous mm. it's playful it's evocative it also let the limbs get broken it's like all different sort of different type of dynamic starts to happen in the work and um, you know it seems interesting uh, having left pakistan and come to america it's you know and having left that the sort of domestic uh, enclosed environment of the scroll and then experiencing sort of broader culture and thinking about these things in in different ways and this idea of the monstrous which is really powerful in the early work which you see here on the left and then also the idea of which which you we will all see is a sort of repetition of motifs which becomes sort of part of your practice uh, to this day a kind of use of a development of a range of sort of personal symbols which are used in constructing not necessarily a legible narrative but part of a kind of uh, stream that runs through your art so the work on the right is a more recent stone mosaic which is a reprise of the motif which you see on the left there from the uh, early 1990s yeah yeah you know that it's also a very iconic form but i've spoken about it a lot in the past like mm. the there are no feet it's self rooted it's mm. a float so in that sense it's very buoyant but it's self referential so you can carry your roots with you it's also a playful idea of a beheadedness which is like the expunging of the feminine from culture politics history playful beheadedness <laughs> yeah <laughs> playful beheadedness so and then at the same time without injecting a face you know it was it was i was speaking more in terms of like the problematics of the feminine right. whether it's the misogyny present towards women whether it's the lack right. of representation for women in the right. art world so it was able to reside in multiple ways hmm. and that became really exciting for me is to develop iconographies that could that could represent my experience but they could also um you know can they could exist simultaneously in different time spaces right and they're not characters it's not like yeah. they're identity yeah. driven there are some early uh works from the 90s yeah and then also you know breaching of national boundaries like that mm. was critical for me and and though you know at that time art history was talking about fem uh, feminism and female artists but by and large even like the early books mixed blessings and all the early ones you know there was really just one big category for the third world right representation Lumped so together. like yeah. yeah so like that idea of like how do you call yourself out of the third world representation mm. like that that in response to some of that type of um language then things became even more um engaged with the feminine mm. and the idea of the feminine and many of these iconographies are happening by me juxtaposing um you know um poets and authors female feminist poets say pakistani fami daryas is machtai parveen shake these are people that would not necessarily be known in the us now right. it's different but at that time for sure and how could they intersect with julia kristeva helen susu or bell hooks for example mm. and the more i did that the more it gave me the freedom to invent forms 
based on these juxtapositions, which were not necessarily happening in art history or in books or in curriculum or in discussions around my work. It was just me kind of like finding ways of, of, um, of sparking new ideas and new conversations. And when, as soon as I started to sort of do that, it, it meant really um, broader ideas about learning and unlearning confinement and opening and you know um kind of not necessarily just shape-shifting but definitely about the relationships of 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 um race and gender and sexuality across cultures across race across uh generations and that suddenly um is like you know opens up many many exciting possibilities of forms and then I can bring these forms for example back into the space of the miniature which for me doesn't necessarily mean size but means um, a nano sort of a notion of the nano detail mm. kind of how do you engage with precision without necessarily making detail ornate and that's been really um, a sort of a conversation across mediums also right i mean I, I know sense. you've talked it does i think you, you've talked a lot previously about the idea of beauty being something which is evident in your work but also has the potentiality for being subversive and the seductive nature of paint is something can be subversive and can be something that can be used against forms of authority in, in society, whether patriarchy, et cetera. But also I think that what you're talking about, that question of uh, the, the minuteness and uh, figuration and a development of symbolic language is also, you know, this is, I see it as your subversiveness. That's part of your radical practice in a sense. And, I, and you know, a figure like this, which you developed when you were in grad school and then have used since in a work there on the right from the 1990s and then here a mosaic which we'll talk about very shortly uh, at Princeton and that kind of continuity of using this particular figure um, is all part of that so maybe you want to talk just for a minute about this this form yeah you know the, this form as you can see is one of several forms which uses the human which uses the feminine but then again as we talked earlier it is the beheaded female form. And it's also looking at a lot of art, uh, sculpture. It's also looking at, um, you know, iconoclasticism. It's also looking at what happens when, uh, what happens with colonial imperial histories? Mm. What happens when um, things are removed from one culture and placed in another? The ownership issues. It also talks, it, so it, for me, it's a very, um, it's a very, uh, it's multivalent. Yeah. There's many ways of engaging with it and many visual associations that you can bring to it. But it also has an interesting history in my own work. I'm not sure if we have that image in, in, in our slide presentation, but later when I was, I, I was working on a commission project, which was with, for, Scadden Arps law firm mm -hmm. and September 11th happens and one this particular character with its many faceted arms and some weapons is in there right which talks about like the kind of the ferociousness of the feminine mm -hmm. and I remember that they I was brought in and asked to remove it and yeah. I think I, I walked out on that commission but it was um, corporate it, it lawyers was, it was causing problems so yeah, so so again, censorship happens, you know, yeah. constantly is is kind of happening. Though the form happened much earlier, but the form already was imagining all these sort of histories. Huh. So yeah, for example, yeah, like here maybe it's present in the top left corner. It's that the nature, the the, the ideas behind that particular engagement with these characters in the previous like the simple forms in black ink that you saw earlier but like this particular painting for me is is very exciting because 
here it questions who's bailed anyways mm -hmm. and you know here the protect like so you can see the before and after so if you saw the current work which is in, in the whitney's collection and looked at it through a, a magnifying glass you will see that under the white line is the male the the sort of stock character of the male polo mm -hmm. player is pretty present so that was my way of opening up, you know, um, kind of one could see that the that it's a desexualization of the miniature or the androgynous nature that I usually associate miniature painting with. The erotic nature is also very androgynous. Mm -hmm. And then it was also uh, playing with the idea of the white as the editing tool. This is at the time when I was reading Helen Sassou and, you know, and, and there is this sort of uh, the ecriture feminine, the white ink, which is from Sassou's 94, which is, so here I paint over the male figure with that white editing tool, but it's, but it's also very directly linked to the uh, medium of miniature painting because all the palette, the colors that I make, what I first do is like I mix every, I mix a large batch of white and then I add color in every, um, um, in, 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 in the white itself. Right. So white is like, you're, you can say it's the, uh, the base, the foundation. And so if you remove all the color, then you're left with the white. And mm. then the white is also the white uh, notion of the white ink that she talks about. So here it's a playfulness on so many levels. And um, yeah, so I kind of, this is another sort of idea of maybe wit and candor. Yeah. For me, humor is very essential <laughs> in art, but I'm also like- Disturbing <laughs> humor. So yes, yeah, so it's, it's, yeah. So it was, it was definitely, it's not autobiographical, but right. also anarchy. Yeah. Definitely. Like if you look at these things, they, they are, there's no central uh, position of power. Yeah. There's no center of power, right? It's, so it's kind of, I have decentered the whole thing. And that was inevitable. When you look at the book, um, miniature painting, you know, it's, mm. it comes out of book illustration. There is always going to be a margin mm. and a center. So this relationship between center margin is fertile space for for shifting shifting those boundaries for playing with those boundaries and the so viewer's focus you, yeah yeah you see them here sometimes the fit forms explode outside of the boundaries like a you know the yeah. person tumbling out of a panel in a comic book um yeah. but also upsetting your vision and figures who are upside down and that idea of the monstrous and the grotesque is is brilliantly uh envisioned in these kinds of works you know and when i finished RISD, then at that time i think i had a choice to either i had applied to residency so it was the core program mm -hmm. the glassell or i think the anderson ranch so i decided to do the core program because it was longer and so i drove from houston uh, from providence to houston and and when I arrived in Houston, Texas, that's when, you know, a few months later, I hadn't, I had not yet learned about the Project Row Houses. So, so the earlier two works are really about my first encounter with the Project Row Houses and, you know, doing one of the projects there myself. But also this is the time when, you know, the Million Man March was happening. I don't know if people will remember that, but I was interested in all of these other histories of North and South, like the nation of Islam was making headlines. And I was interested mm -hmm. what that meant in terms of black and blackness and Islam, because again, you know, having lived in Somalia, having had a different relationship to, to another Muslim culture that also experienced incredible American interventions of war and famine later, like all of these issues are very politi political issues. And then when you go from north to south, you're also Texas at that time and en route to Texas, stopping in different other places. I, I was, you cannot escape that imperialism and is, you know, you juxtapose it with colonialism. And then you sort of see how they interface. 
Right. And so a lot of this kind of work uh, stems from, from all of this period experience and my own kind of where my interests are headed and what I'm started, what I've started to read and engage with. So, yeah, so that was uh, the, the armorial bearings dealt with, uh, with a lot of the politicized representations, you know, mm -hmm. of the veil at that time, mm -hmm. as well as uh, also the, you know, rep derogatory representations of black and medieval West sort of in the icon paintings. Right. So the armorial bearings reference to that. So then coming back to this, coming to this work, the Hood's Red Rider, it's also, you know, again, there's a very, there's always this darkness in children's tales. Mm. And many of the, uh, many of them are also the, you know, they are familiar across culture and, and language and translation. So here, I think the, the beheaded, feminine forms are morphing into um, the, I don't know, maybe it's like for me here, it's, it's uh, the female, the little character, the female. Is she meant to be a gymnast? I was wondering. Yeah, I think yeah. again, it plays with this. With a, with a bubble thing. The relatively free, agile figure or the mm. form, right? Mm. It's some assault. It's, it's also floating upwards. It's moving. It's yeah. playing with iconographies like I think the turtle always in the Hindu um, mythologies also kind of refers to like how it carries the world on its back. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, there's a playfulness there. With this headless figure on its back. Uh, yeah. And the, the female body then becomes a symbol mm -hmm. of the world. Of the yeah, world. And also this uprooted fem female figure, you know, it's kind of, I'm it's refusing to belong. Yeah. To be fixed or to be, just always in dialogue with a with its with the with its narrow definition of the other. So when it refuses that relationship, it's not always the work's never always going to be in dialogue with the colonized history. Mm. Sometimes it's got to be independent of that too. <laughs> yeah, that's how I felt as an artist, right? So yeah. so that's sort of it's playful. It those some of the so that's where I, it's also a play on the Red Riding Hood. Mm -hmm. And there's a series, Hood's Red Rider, or, mm -hmm. is also of that time. But, yeah, this is and the then, show at the Drawing Center in 1997. Yes, yes. So here, it was great. I had, I, you know, at RISD, Kara was, I overlapped with Kara Walker, then also with Julie Marie, too. So um, I, I think, you know, Drawing Center was, like, big when we were at, when one was still a student at RISD, because I think Kara had a big show. One of her early shows was there. Mm -hmm. So I remember sending my slides to the drawing center all the time. Yeah. And I was so interested in drawing because I felt like my work was so rooted in drawing, though I always thought of the small works as paintings, but they were on paper. And because they were always small, they were always considered drawings. So I thought this would be one of the best spaces that I could possibly that could contextualize my work mm. but I don't think that having sent images through the through that sort of in mailing them through that registry was useful because eventually <laughs> I remember how I got the show um, I was tra I came to New York from Houston with uh, my roommate Nicola Costantino and uh, I, I was a TA with Marian Staniszewski at RISD the art historian and I think she introduced me to exit art. Mm. And then Nicola ended up getting into a show which was already in place. And I, I wanted to visit the drawing center and the drawing center was closed. And I remember knocking on the door with my portfolio mm. and uh, they opened it and they were installing, but I was like, I'm from tech, I'm visiting, I have my work here. Can we, can you, can I just share it with you? <laughs> And I, you know, and, I, and we showed the work, Annie Philbin was there, Jamie was there, and, and, and I, I ended up, you know, get, getting into a, into one of the spring exhibitions. So you always got to knock on the door. Don't knock have, on the door. I don't know always how knock on the changed, door. right? <laughs> but this is, I think it was the tail end of a different era. Like, yeah, it's the way to go. So, <laughs> so it's always a very precious story for me, drawing yeah. center. And then Annie Philbin was phenomenal 
and I, I remember having the key to the drawing center. I had the whole mm. space for oh, like a month or three. And, I, and then that's when I had the space. I was like, oh, let me do some wall drawing. Yeah. And, you know, so, so, so that's how things happen. And starting to experiment on a larger scale with works yeah. on a larger scale. Yeah. But I, 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 I'm intrigued by the way that you still refer to them as miniature because of the, the um, fastidiousness with which you make the drawings and the designs and the detailing that in your mind, they're still part of a kind of seam running through your art, which is related to the miniatures. Yeah, I think it's, uh, there's a whole topic on like the terminology of miniature as being incredibly mm -hmm. problematic, limited. Right. And of course, yes, that's like another discussion around, yeah. around, around some of these acquired uh, terms that are, mm -hmm. that are as problematic as like, you know, Islamic art. Right. So, um, so yeah. I'm going to go through some of these early works okay. because I want to get to some are. of the later things and, uh, and, you know, some of these works and it's really interesting. People should do a little looking into, um, uh, the reaction that you had to nine 11. And of course, uh, the American overreaction in the wake of that and all over the world. Um, and in our own, in our, in our own country, we're still struggling with that today. But these kinds of images, which resulted with works like No Fly Zone on the right, uh, or the work you see here, Pleasure Pillars, um, the, a kind of juxtaposition of forms and figures and references from uh, multiple uh, cultures and time periods in this uh, wonderful melange of forms, sly offering uh, here, uh, sexualized imagery uh, connected with scenes which relate to violence and uh, war planes and this kind of stuff. You can see the kind of difficulty of the period, these angels with stars and stripes, wings, all these kinds of elements. Yeah, I want to yeah. point out to Pleasure Pillar, for example, mm -hmm. one little point that I want to make is that, you know, the Pleasure Pillar is also about, for me, was like, you know, how uh, so much of, of the saving of the Muslim woman, that mm -hmm. problematic narrative that has right. been used in waging war, for example, in, in Afghanistan, like I was questioning that. That's very, that's very different, a way of like understanding the work that it speaks back to the very paternalistic and fetishized gender discourses, which is, which is different than a multicultural idea of, right. of, 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 uh, of culture and time and women. It's mm. really about taking the sensuous, the pleasurable, the embodiment of that and taking ownership of that, centering the narratives around that, not as the, you know, woman awaiting the savior mm. that I was critiquing earlier and the representation in the traditional miniature, but in general is the uh, West saving the Muslim woman. Pushing back the- Yeah, unquote, pushing savior. back that, yeah. yeah. So that type of, a lot of it is, you know, again, it continues in the further images on this idea of power and powerlessness. Mm. And, and how do you explore that tension mm. while making works that are intrinsically poignant and, and embrace beauty, but are culturally transformative and relevant. Right. And are trying to connect with people using this kind of figuration. Yeah. So thanks for sharing this. Yeah, I, I sent it in the morning, but yeah, I just wanted okay. to show like, again, like a lot, there was a whole period where I was making, like I was, I had already started doing large scale murals and wall drawings and then, you know, and then also playing with drawings directly in relationship hmm. with the wall. So images are painted on the wall, they're painted on these large scale papers, the papers start extending. Mm. They are the, um, the tracing paper, architectural paper, like comes in different yep. sizes. And that slowly started to sort of build in the, into these installations where, you know, where, again, the perspective would change depending on where you were. How, you could even go behind the work. At times, the depths were more than several feet. So that sort of very physical nature of the work, especially the physicality of paper, Mm. Tying it just at the top and letting the air ducts open and letting the paper have a sound and a presence. And then layers of paper led me to into animation. Mm. So this is really a, a period that allows me to think in terms of like, you know, 
um, how you can construct images in layers and then thread them together. So the very early animations from 2001 are, are kind of playing with this, uh, using this sort of tr natural transition from the, in, uh, from the installation into animation. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the early animations, although we're just showing stills. This is called Spin, um, from Spin from 2003. It's kind yeah, of which is again like a play on CNN. Yeah, Spin and so CNN. Spin with double N, and it's also about how, you know, the kind of violence and systemic racism, cultural fears, how they are deeply embedded mm. in in media, in political representations, in cultural representations, and. So and, it plays with uh, with this idea of justice and liberty and capitalist, it, and, capitalist yeah. culture and domination yeah. over the globe. So and, that yeah. little figure here is not, though she looks Michelangelo like a yeah. sibyl from the Sistine ceiling, uh, which she is in the form that you see here on the right from a stock certificate from the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company, <laughs> one of these wonderful uh, copper engraved stock certificates. Um, with this figure of justice here holding her sword and looking at the balance which you've adapted into the center of the composition. And then this image of the Gobi hair. Uh, so yeah, so if you, uh, so people often ask like where, what is that? So all I've done is remove the figure, right? The, another lopping off of heads. Right? Yeah, so like the figures are removed. What is left is just the hair, very mm -hmm. much intact. So I've not even altered or changed it. It's just left there. But then as it through movement and early animation like spin, for example, the movements are very different. They are, you know, later it gets more sophisticated yeah. with um, working with Patrick O'Rourke in terming in determining, you know, how like little elements can be particle systems and and developing a whole uh, movement and choreograph movements with that form. But if you were to come back to the root of it, it's just the silhouette of the head, the bun, the hair. And that for me was really, again, another departure in terms of like the possibilities that exist in how you peruse older paintings. And also how, you know, this idea can be, um, uh, you can write a code and come up with different directions and movements. So it's like mm. the kinetic nature of the, of the painting. And if I go back to the Safavid period, when you look at them, there's so much density. They are so yeah. compact. Like if you were to disrupt one little detail, everything would unravel. Uh. And that's how I would imagine that, oh, you know, they are full of like, they, they are like motion, full of motion. And then if I disrupt them, they will, they will, they will fall apart, but they will. So that notions of anarchy and movement and velocity mm. and scale and magnitude are all aspects in the drawing, but they do get defined differently through animation. Mm. So there's a element of animation, which is happening in the two thousands in your work. And also these uh, wonderful large scale drawings that you're doing at places like the Venice Biennale in the MCA in Sydney, which you see here, um, taking over an entire wall with this kind of chaotic scrim of imagery. Um, and uh, then it sort of comes together in this great uh, scroll-like panoramic film uh, called Parallax, which it was made in 2013 and traveled all over uh, the world. Parallax, that idea of the position or direction of an object appears to differ when viewed from different positions, uh, like through the lens of a camera, taking the whole cubist notion of space and vision and turning it into something panoramic and dynamic. And then also I like the idea that parallax in itself was shown all over the world. So uh, the perspective then becomes the varying perspectives of people um, uh, throughout the, uh, the known universe in a sense. Uh, we're not going to show you any clip of it. I'm going to show you some clips of Reckoning later, but just here's a couple images of it, multi-channel film with original score. Here it is in the UAE and uh, in uh, Auckland at the Triennial. And you can get a sense of what it looks like large scale in the Linda Pace Foundation in San Antone in Texas, which I know you're fond of. Um, Bill Bao, 2015. And here's what uh, 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 Shazia was talking about with these 
sort of forms, which are then dispersing um, white and black forms, the, the use of spheres and circles, and that uh, kind of almost like the forms themselves become pixelations, uh, very sublime element here. And I want people to look at this form in the center because we're gonna look at that for a minute in some detail. Uh, it is a Christmas tree, kind of, as you'll see, the installation at the uh, Contemporary Art Museum in Rome. And then here, uh, a drawing on the left, a response to the oil rigs called Christmas trees, and a photograph on the right of one of these Christmas trees, as they are actually called uh, in the desert. And that idea of a tree, uh, which uh, I read in one of the new essays, I think it was uh, Sadia Abbas's essay, the tree as something which is a giving tree, right? It's something that you use for presents giving and to celebrate a birth in Christianity, but also something which on the right is about the rape of the planet and its resources and also the incursion of capitalist uh, corporate entities into uh, the Middle East and throughout that uh, tortured reg region. So maybe talk a little bit about the way the Christmas tree becomes uh, part of your symbology and also an element in uh, the film Parallax. Oh yeah, so when, you know, Parallax was done for the Shah Jahan Biennial. So, we, so I had like more than a year or more to do research. I, I did not have the, I, I didn't know that I was gonna make Parallax. I was very keen to travel and be there. And, and in many visits and doing research, I came across the British Petroleum Magazine, magazines mm -hmm. from at that era, from the 60s, I think, and then came across that particular um, photograph that you sh shared. At that time, I didn't know that the oil rigs were called Christmas trees, to be really honest. Mm. Like that was, uh, for me, it was like, wow, okay. So the English wit, the gift bearing sentiment. Yes. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, then, then that again gave me the idea that I could actually take that armature of the oil rig and create Christmas trees. So that's what, that's what that is happening here. What you see it is, uh, and then, yes, so what, what I, in, in, in the upcoming show, I do have a couple of, of works which, where I have returned to that idea, but I never really had, like oftentimes, you know, I, I have an idea, but then I, I haven't really um, explored it in full, uh, in its capacity, in its full depth. So in, in Parallax, there's only a moment when you see the Christmas trees proliferate like they, they kind of they accumulate and and then there's a it breaks the screen breaks apart mm -hmm. and you see another dimension to the story from behind so it's the idea of the mirage or you know parallax itself and so so the tree is not really the uh, the foremost idea in in parallax so then in the paintings that i've made i have been able to uh, explore that where I uh, I don't know if it's here but the painting oil and poppies that I think we have in our yeah let's go to that oh, oh okay we can come back to okay it later. We'll come but back. basically also you know how the fault lines of, of we talked about representation and yeah. race and gender but when they also intersect in so many ways with capitalism and that for me is where the, this icon of the tree is really significant mm. because it's a symbol of extraction. Yeah. And, and then the counter narrative to that, that I can play with is art and literature and poetry as the mm. means of giving and, you know, expansion and not extraction, right. sowing seeds and growth versus, and that kind of led me into interest in, in, in our climate, in many books around um, uh, what's going on. And then the, the sort of the new animation mm. deals with some of the new animation reckoning deals with yeah. some of those issues. Yeah. Last view here of Parallax when it went to Hawaii. It's great if you get to go to all these places with the film, that's the best. Absolutely, that was really good. One and of the I, perks. <laughs> yeah, and then also the, you know, the, the, Having done um, Parallax, uh, it, was, it, was far, it was a more complex process than doing the single channel. Because mm. though it's a, 
three channel, it's single image. Yeah. So you have to conceive the whole thing, not as three different vignettes, but it's like one, like the single composition. Right. So a lot of times it was all these drawings are fairly small. Mm. And then when I scale them up, they are scanned. And when you scale them, you can't just keep scaling and change, seeing what it will look like. So you have to really imagine and project. And then you only understand the, the, the success or the problematics of the work once you, know, once you see it installed in sight at the mm. site. So my first experience of, of, of it literally was when we were installing at the Shah Jard Biennial. Oh, well, the first time you actually saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. At that I should mention it's over 15 minutes long and it's, it's a kind of history of the Strait of Hormuz. Hormuz. But, but yeah. that's, you know, that's just me simplifying it a little bit. But, yeah, uh, and then the movement of resources and commodities yeah. and some right. of those issues that have happened in other works like the last post too yeah. so it's it's uh it deals with histories of trade and east india company okay yeah. so now so, we are into the princeton project yeah so this is a recent project at princeton university at the uh, julius romo rabinowitz building in lewis a simpson international building which is where uh some of the departments are and um uh, economics and, and uh, international studies. And the, there are two works there. There's this large scale, very tall, 66 foot tall mosaic, um, which is called Ecstasy as Sublime, Heart as Vector. So I just want to show everybody if some shots of this. We can talk about some of it. And people should start to notice um, some of the imagery, which should be familiar as part of um, Shazia's canon, in a sense and others which are not so familiar, which we'll look at. Yeah, so, you know, again, there's a video on this. If people wanted to know further, they can see it. Um, but this, for me, I, I, yeah, this is at a time when I won this art, uh, a public art project, but this is 215 or 14 or 15. So Parallax was showing in, in multiple places across in different parts of the world. So then uh, that's where I was like, oh, that's such a cinematic use of space. And the space I had at Princeton was so vertical. So I just thought of like turning that upside down mm. and what that would mean in terms of like no particular center, but the entire mosaic runs from the bottom of the building till the roof. So it's uh, so you can walk part of it. Forty about forty feet are visible from the atrium when you enter, but then when you walk, come to the building from from the stairs, then you can walk in very close proximity to about you know the two floors, and yeah. then it continues. So that type of unraveling of the upward movement of the forms and the and the composition are again very closely linked to my interpretations of the uh, uh, of paint, painterly traditions in mm -hmm. in um, in Persian in the Safavid in in Timurid like multiple sort of um, cues that I have played with and there's this movement from as we've tried to trace for everybody a bit today miniatures painting to the large scale wall paintings and kind of environmental paintings that you were talking about on architectural paper, et cetera, into uh, video film using pixelation and now into tesserae, these oh, yeah. pieces of glass, which are part of the mosaic, which is uh, the construction of the, this mural, this tall mural. And you see here uh, is a shot of uh, Shazia at, um, the famous Franz Mayer of Munich studio in Germany. Uh, those of you who are New Yorkers, you know the Upper East Side. This is the same firm that worked on Vic Muniz's wonderful mosaics at the 72nd Street Q stop, Q station at the MTA. Um, and here you have some of the designs and laying out the pieces that you see here. So you just gave me some details, these sort of forms, but. Yeah, because I was literally thinking like mosaic, again, it's so connect. My arrival to mosaic was really from the pixel, mm. from like the pixel in the animation or the digital work and the pixel. And then 
from pixel, the, uh, the unit of mosaic suddenly had more interest and resonance yeah. for me than wanting to, you know, just take an image and, and make a mosaic out of it. Like I became very much invested in like what it, why would I do mosaic? So of course there were other very pragmatic logistical -ish concerns because I was not expecting to win the Princeton uh, public artwork. I had sent in a proposal and forgotten about it. So I had applied, I had never really done permanent public artwork. So my proposal was really theoretical. It talked only about trade and econ e economies. And, and I think the um, um, stakeholders, because it was to be in the economics building and mm -hmm. the international building. So some of the stakeholders were economists, which I didn't know at that time. So eventually that's probably how you know, the project, uh, I, I kind of got a call, won it. And at that time, the big challenge was like, all my proposals are time-based video animation works. And here I had to think in terms of longevity right. and drawing and works on paper doesn't hold that, right? Yeah. So that's when I ended up meeting um, Franz Mayer and Michael and, and visited Munich and knew right away that that would they I, they that I in the short time like we had I think ten months mm. to accomplish the whole project and um, I I spent some time in Munich and developed the project there and I wanted to do two I wasn't even expected I had to do only one but I wanted to so I ended up doing two projects and utilizing all the money for the art. And one is the 70 foot mosaic and the other one is a glass painting, which, um, which the Franz Mayer studio also um, produced and fabricated. Right. And uh, yeah. Yeah, we wanted to show that. I mean, I think it's really interesting as you see this, the dichotomy between the Gothic architecture of Princeton traditional buildings on campus, mm -hmm. and then the modern building, which links buildings together to make a bigger space. And then your use of, you know, an age old material, which is one that found its way throughout the Mediterranean and into the East. And, you know, see my mosaic it was used by so many different ancient cultures and putting that in there is, is uh, I think quite a, quite a, ge a gesture. Yeah, and choosing choice. things, right? Like the choice of I'm not grouting the material. Yeah. So it's like every little piece is a completely different shape. Yeah. And then it's the glass as well as stone and marble. Right. And it's also really like, you know, uh, very much like speaking from, like letting the material speak and not yeah. be dictated by the image. Right. So there was this freedom that we didn't, one didn't have, one could all, one could shift the image hmm. if, if the material took more, uh, uh, you know, precedent over, oh, so like some of the, some of the details when you come up close and you see them, they are found uh, glass, which is molted in a certain way yeah. or a, a marble piece that worked really well. So, so all of those choices were made hand on, hands on with the material at the site. And yeah, um, consistent in your practice, that kind of hands on. Yeah. Mm. So that, and I think in that first image where you see the, the, fi the figure and the, the skeletal yeah. part, that sort of, for me, is again, the struggle between imagination and the lack of it. Yeah. So the lack of imagination is represented in this sort of struggle between life and death. Mm. And then you can also see some of the, elements we were we etched they were etched into the into the stone so that's why you can get these incredibly fine details yeah huh. Huh. so so the, but it's very seamless and there's another work there that's part of this uh complex which is a painting on glass glass painting um I w we want to get to questions so i'm going to move ahead a little bit but just to show people this because okay. they can go and visit it once the school is reopened again. Uh, ridiculously, I was there in October at a conference and I, I didn't go, I didn't get to go. So next time 
Uh, I'm down in Prince, I gotta check it out. But this uh, magnificent painting on glass, got quintuplet uh, effect, um, which you see here, two views of it. And it made me think of a work which is just down Route 1 in Philadelphia, not far from Princeton at all. It goes past my childhood home. Route 1, this is the Bride Strip Bear by her bachelor's, even uh, Duchamp, uh, the large glass, famous large glass. But you have one uptim or three uptim in terms of scale, because this work on the right uh, is much oh, yeah. larger, much larger. And these uh, marvelous painted forms that you see in here um, and this was also uh, done at, by, at, in Munich, right? Which is also fabricated. Right, yeah. It was Munich. all painted on glass directly. Yeah. And in there the are case. lots of images here that relate to other works, uh, which unfortunately we don't have time uh, to get into oh, today. Oh, really? We're okay, so we've run two and a half, two or an hour and a half. Oh but, my gosh. I know. So I, we it, didn't get to our late night. Like, no, but we're going to talk about Mariam. We're going to talk about Mariam. Okay, okay. Are we going to show the sculpture? Yeah, and we'll show okay. the final sculpture. Um, and these sort of works, images of falling figures that are all related to a whole uh, series of symbolic works that, uh, that are part of this piece. Uh, yeah. That are part of this piece. And this uh, wonderful image of Adam Smith uh, in East India Company attire, which is part of a larger project that um, Shazi has been working on and ideas around the East India Company and uh, its relationship to South, Southeastern Asia. Um, and also done in stone mosaic. So that translation of forms into different media, I think is one of the real, real strengths of your art uh, at the moment. And this is from a film, another film called The Last Post, which is about the East India Company and the artists who were associated with it in its waning days. But I wanna go ahead to, um, uh, we had a lot of stuff, go ahead a little bit and uh, show you, here's the Brooklyn Rail cover uh, earlier work by uh, Shazia where we, and it, this contains an interview uh, with Sarah Christoph, uh, Christoph inside and it was from November 2016. So right at the moment of the ascendance of Trump um, and then a lot of works which came out of that uh, titled Empire Falls Art, States of Agitation, a kind of reaction to the present politics uh, in this country. But they have also manifested themselves in the form of a video called Reckoning. And I just want to show a, a clip from Reckoning so people get an idea, okay, of what your films look like. This is a new film, Reckoning, HD video animation with sound, music by Du Yun, and animation by Patrick O'Rourke, a frequent collaborator uh, with Shazia. And it's 14, four minutes long, four minutes long, but I'm going to show everybody just a brief uh, clip from it.
said. Okay, yeah. It was a little bit skipping, but that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I will be able to, I also just realized this was a version with a slightly different sound. So I sent ah. you a, but, but I do want to mention the score by Dian also features uh, Zay Bangash, a fantastic Pakistani um, singer. Yeah, the sound's pretty amazing. Yeah, she's and fantastic. You, you see what, so. what you were talking about, this sort of swirling of forms and pixelation and the way that it kind of translates into the tesserae of the mosaic and then these sort of elemental figures who are battling, which you, which you saw uh, in, these, in these drawings uh, that I just showed, um, these kind of figures here on the right yeah. who then come to vivid, pulsating and sort of shimmering life in this video. I, I can't wait to see it in a... In a yeah, it's sort of it's setting. also like relationships, you know, throughout the mm -hmm. full animation on where relationships that encompass some moment of reckoning, whether mm -hmm. it's the whether it's the immigrant and the citizen, whether it's the woman woman in power, whether it's the father and son, or it's the the joust that's happening yeah. the, with the warriors too, and this uprooted idea of this. A tree that uproots is also, you know, it plays again with our current sort of situation with climate, with housing, with uh, with even creative spirit, dark to light, like mm. we all go through that. So it's kind of plays a lot on, it's sort of a dramatic restaging of a, of a Indian Persian miniature painting. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah, it's extraordinary. Get to this part of, and that idea of subvers subversive beauty, which we were talking about, so evident here. And then that uh, layering of forms on the surface, I think, is is amazing in these. Um, okay, this is the oh, oil, yeah. and, oil and poppies, which we had mentioned, the Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. and then yeah. Poppies, of course, relation to the drug trade, I assume. And uh, yeah. And then oil and heroin and these pseudo exports, um, but these shimmering. Uh, gouache drawings and paintings, uh, extraordinary new works. So I'm going to go ahead to uh, some of the portraits here, which you see um, Aretha Frank Franklin on the right, uh, right after her death, portraits that um, they're not necessarily straight likenesses here of AOC from 2016. I told someone she was going to be Speaker of the House someday and they thought I was crazy, but <laughs> let's hope. Um, and the Gobi hair there swirling around her. Uh, Angela Davis, who of course has been very present wonderfully again in the last couple months with the BLM movement. And these washy, uh, very evocative portrait paintings. And then this one, Mary M. And this is related to the last two things we're going to talk about today, which is uh, public artwork in Houston. Um, Mary M. Uh, who is this figure? Yeah, so this figure is... Um has many connotations. So it's the Mary Magdalene or the interpretation of Mary Magdalene. It's the many, many Miriams and the Marys that, <laughs> that come in different forms in all sorts of um, you know, cultural and religious iconographies. So it's sort mm -hmm. of the feminine in nature because uh, as you'll see, the portrait is part of a fountain that I made. And it kind of, the face emerges out of the water so when you're, when you're kind of there, it close up, you can't fully always see the face, yep. but if you happen to be in the building next door and look down, then you can really see the entire face sort of looking upward in definition. And, but in, with the water, it's also about um, the kind of this emergence of the, of the female from nature. Hmm. And how did this commission come about? This commission, you know, Houston is, uh, again, like I think of Houston as my second home. So I have, uh, I have a lot of uh, connections, friends, and people in the art world. And I think I was very honored to be, uh, to be part of a project, which is very local, mm -hmm. and to contribute to it as, um, as somebody who's been present in Texas and in Houston in particular. So. Wow. My uncle Barry lives in Houston. I think he's with us today. So, with, oh yeah. Hope you got to go check it out, Barry, if you haven't seen it. Ma magnificent image, it's, as you can see from the the photo here. Also fabricated in Munich at Franz Meyer's studio, yeah. on a large scale. 
Yeah. It doesn't look as large in these pictures, but it's actually quite big. So the last thing we want to look at today is this work. Oh, yeah. Promiscuous Intimacies. I know. The title, Promiscuous Intimacies, is, is really, I'm borrowing it in dialogue. It's in dialogue with mm. uh, a, a text by my uh, dear friend and scholar and feminist, uh, uh, Gayatri Gopinath, who's written, who's at NYU, but mm -hmm. she, she's written a, a, a wonderful uh, essay, which will be in the upcoming uh, monograph. And, yeah, it's really um, good. It's yeah. very good. So, so in her words, sort of, it's, you know, it's like things that she's written about my work, but I was also um, interested in, again, reclaiming iconographies that are in my work. But this was the first time I've been able to create like a, a full on uh, three dimensional sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I um, kind of, you know, they are protagonists that, that are uh, from a different time. And yet it's this backward glance where you can like think of the Greco-Roman Venus and the Indian uh, Devi, the Devata or the celestial figure, right? And yet they, it's also their relationship is in play, which is for me the suggestive embrace, the intertwined sort of feminine bodies that are, mm. at one, that are bearing the symbolic sort of weight of representations but at the same time they can you know they also do evoke a very non-heteronormative desire as, as not something being um uh for for that to be you know for, for i'm claiming that according to like guy three's essay too in dialogue with that that it is authentic that these ideas of tradition and and culture and representations are fluid mm. over time that they are constantly changing and moving. So this sort of looking backward to look forward, to think of the present as a, as a very continuous, unstable moment. I like to call it one step back and two steps up. Yeah. And, and also- the past to invigorate the present. Yeah, so I just wanna mention that there was another, um, Sarah Bond, another historian whose work when I was reading a couple of years ago was, about this idea of color in classical statuary and mm -hmm. how in our, you know, how we assume that some of, 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 it, of it is sort of white or lily white in popular imagination and how I'm, so I'm gonna, I'm working, this is a work in progress. So yeah. we'll be uh, playing with, with the idea of color through patina in the, in the actual final work in the bronze. So you see it here in clay as a kind of maquette. And yeah. then here as a four foot or so tall uh, bronze on the right. Um, yeah. And then on the left is, as Shazia was saying, it, it's, it's not a new composition. It's something you've been thinking about for a long time here, 20 years ago. Yeah, but see like, but at that time, the relationship was- And something um, different. Meant different because that's very mm. specifically the Venus yeah. from Bronzino. So it's like the, the anti-classical impulse the mannerist and already the Indian aesthetic, both are the outsiders of the Western classical. Yeah. But here, the relationship is really a, a co going to be completely different. Plus it was, you know, I was like, I wanted to create a sculptural work. So it made more sense to me to really investigate anything that was already present in my vocabulary yeah. and to see first if it, if it would be successful. But interestingly, it started aligning with our current moment, sure. not current, but definitely it's been going on, but the toppling of these uh, monuments. And so much of that is all this sort of, you know, male representation. So to kind of see that from the lens of gender right now, for mm -hmm. me becomes even more, um, it has so much more power right now to be, to be engaging with feminine forms. Yeah. And, and then, history and art history and boundaries around nation and nas nationalism and how all of those things, you know, can are, are porous. Right. And thinking about global histories of art in a very different way. And of course, yeah. here, I love the fact the way that the Devata is on top. She is the elevated figure. And the Venus yeah. then becomes the base. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. But they are both, they are very intertwined. Yes. Her, like her, as in a manner as composition. Yeah. Because yeah, it's also... She's hold. She is holding her foot. Yeah. 
the Devi, I, I, the original Devi doesn't have the limbs. So I yeah, added right. those. So it said it, she's lifting her up. And her necklace. She's grabbing yeah. her necklace. Wonderful. So where do you think this might end up? Don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I will see. <laughs> uh, yeah. But that's the beauty of, of putting work out into public, into yeah. the world, out, yeah. out of your studio. I also want to mention that this is being, I'm, I'm fabricating this with the wonderful UAP. Okay, great. So, uh, um, Shazia will have an exhibition uh, this fall in October at Sean Kelly uh, in Chelsea. Um, hopefully everyone will be able to go see it. That's our our small dream and you can see some of this uh, these kinds of works and what she's been working on but thank you so much for talking to us today i mean we went for an hour 40 we could obviously keep going there's so much to discuss but uh, i'm going to turn it over to malvika who has people who want to burning with questions if you have the fortitude to keep going but from myself thank you so much this has been a wonderful thank conversation thank you thank you jason fantastic Thank you so much to both of you. Um, Shazia, I've really, I've, I can't tell you this has been like so lovely, um, especially your comments on sort of miniature painting as kind of a means of learning a language like adjacent to Urdu, also like a visual language and everything you were saying about breaching national boundaries. Um, I've just found this like really wonderful and I'm sure our audience has too. Um, so our first question comes from um, one of our favorites, Deanna Lee. Deanna, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Hello, thank you, Malvika, and thank you to everybody at the rail. This is, again, wonderful conversation. And um, Shazia, thank you so much. Um, I just have to tell you that I'm a big fan of your work since the 90s. I saw your work in the biennial. And then also I had the pleasure of learning much more about your work and, and when I worked at the um, Asia Society and um, and Who Art 21 too. So it's just been a, a, a tremendous pleasure um, to hear you talk in more in depth. And I just wanted to sort of mention a couple of things and ask you to expand on things. Um, going back to the initial, I guess, mention uh, at the beginning of the conversation, this, this frustration of this perception of your work, you know, as being, um, Kind of obvious culturally specific and you know i'm i'm highly conscious of that as well being a, a woman artist of asian descent and so if any any technique or material seems you know at all related to some traditional form like how that will affect the perception of the work etc and it just makes it makes me think about the power of institutions um specifically the power of, edu of education and access to information and to history and then also the power of the art market in the sort of global distribution of culture and so i wonder if you could answer i guess two questions one is like how do you see the public edu um, art education or cultural education in pakistan today how is it different from when you were experiencing it and then the second question is with um the global distribution of artwork through a predominantly like Western perspective through art fairs and biennial exhibitions. How do you see your work is perceived differently depending on where it's shown? Yeah, of course, I think what we were talking is such in a different time bubble. You know, first of all, uh, the world like this, this early nine, early nineties in the US, then, um, 80s in Pakistan, it's a very, very different time frame. You know, the cultures have, have changed and changed in different directions. But they are what has always of interest to me is like, you know, the idea of like um, the idea of, of the Muslim culture in the West still needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed that much, unfortunately. And I think those persisting tropes are very hard. And that's some of those ideas, you know, Franz um, Fanon and, 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 and some of the uh, other sort of histories of colonialism and de that discourse on that, I think is interesting right now because as we are decolonizing public education and education and histories, some of these things are beneficial to be revisiting in terms of, of 
of distance and so much of that doesn't necessarily change but i think definitely in terms of more participation there are more artists there's more connected globally social uh, social media more people in positions of power more people writing about art from different perspectives definitely many many more artists so so that's going to change the nature of work and dialogue and discourse and that is great that for me is keeps me on my feet you know keeps i need to i'm always learning so much more about every uh, of, of not just in terms of art coming out of pakistan but in terms of so much art that you see when you go visit do studio visits with with students in in different universities or even outside of the outside of the art school like you know there's that i find is is very exciting and has definitely shifted in terms of who gets to be an artist and how all of that is definitely i feel changing the temperature of what gets to be defined as american art Right. So do you see that um, most, I mean, it's, it's more of an international kind of um, cultural sphere in, in Pakistan regarding art education, or is it, um, I, mean, I mean, I understand that, that the, there, there's a greater access for everybody now with, with so much more information through the internet, et cetera. But I mean, has, has, the, has the nature of our art education changed in Pakistan? Yeah, there are, I think at that time in, in 90s, there was definitely one art, like one school in Lahore that was the main school, the National College of Arts, but there are many more art schools now. There's, you know, there are many, many, um, uh, the, the nature has to change. It always changes. That's like almost 30 years ago. So the art education has definitely changed and continues to grow. And it's very internationally engaged a lot of Pakistani art is all over the world. I think for me, my, my concerns are often like within the US, that needs to change much more. Yeah, yeah, that's actually much more of sort of my, my interest in terms of, because um, the, at least as I see it, the, the still the, the, there's a lingering hegemonic kind of lens um, in terms of the how, art of by artists who are non-white uh you know are being distributed are being sort of marketed um etc so i just you know I wonder yeah if, yeah i think th of course there's all of that i also have to point out that i haven't done really that many commercial exhibitions so my trajectory has always been really in dialogue with the academia with academics with people that you know writers and sort of a lot of project driven residencies, things that are ephemeral that could not necessarily be collected. I make work at a slow pace. It never sort of sits well with the art market. So I've had a very sort of non-commercial career, so mm -hmm. to speak. And part of it has also often been kind of in response to being um, kind of like the pressure to like, okay, either you set up a, a system of production where people, other people are going to make the miniatures and, and, and then you have a supply and demand thing going on. I never opted for that. So, so these, are, these, are, these are very important conversations I often end up having with other, with students, with definitely a lot of women artists in terms of, of how the, you know, what happens in terms of like, the, the market and the career and uh, and the pressures that people have, but it also is uh, is I think in the inherent in the nature of language that one is engaged with mm -hmm. and the medium too. So um, so yeah. So so if you're talking about the market, it's a very very maybe Jason has uh, some good things to say in terms of more insightful things to say about the market. I don't really have anything to say about the market, except that I love the way that you compare your, your art to poetry and the idea of it as being meticulously crafted and made at your own pace. And Fong often talks about poetry and why we're so dedicated to poetry at the rail, because it's true, because of its truthfulness and the idea that 
uh, poets, th these are not my words, it's Fong's, you know, can't make money off their work. So they have to write what's true. And you, I'm not saying you don't make money off your work, you have an extraordinarily successful career, but that what you're doing is true. What you're doing is, is based in uh, your, your fundamental belief in uh, your ideas and you're doing it in your own speed and, and in your own way. And I think market be damned. That's what we're looking for in artists, you know. And these conversations are all about trying to understand uh, why and how you know artists do things. That's what we're really interested in. We don't want to talk about Sotheby's and Christie's and prices and stuff like that, you know. I mean, you know that. Uh, you know that that's that's the marvelous thing of working in this field. I think you're gonna get us in trouble. Uh, <laughs> we gotta find the mail somehow, no? This is radical. That, that, that's why I was like, let me put this back on. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I, it's not really my place to cut in as the, as the but no I really agree that I think your work um, to me seems like very poetic also in the sense of like you have so many motifs that recur like even in like the same way of like the guzzle lexicon right has like so much yeah. embedded meaning um, and that to work through so much of your visual work to me and your animations is like um, it involves a kind of reading and a kind of like intertextual highly coded like referential reading that kind of creates its own little world um yeah totally like i think even working with collaborating with Jiyan, we're always she always calls the work a symphonic poem and even in terms of literally my sort of culling poetry and um whether it's urdu poetry or ghazal it's in, in its in its structure in its format but then also so many other poets like adrian ridge fantastic poet like you know so there are many many ways in terms of of um aligning with this with poetry and i think also in growing up in pakistan and pakistan has an incredible powerful um history of of revolutionary poetry so for me, that's also been uh, one of the reasons where I didn't really had time in Pakistan. My Urdu was really poor in, and never had that ability and time because I, 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 I was really just ventured right into the miniature painting process. But when I was uh, at, I remember the first time I really delved into Urdu literature was, and, uh, was at the University of Chicago. So when yeah. I was doing my... You ran, uh, yeah, I was at the Renaissance Society, Renaissance Society show, and maybe a residency around that time for several months. And yeah, and that gave me the opportunity to really delve deeper. So again, you know, it depends. You're moving and growing as a, as a thinker, as a individual, as an artist. And for me, poetry often um, in, is so timeless. I, I, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Okay, okay, okay. I hear my son in the background, so <laughs> I hope that's not too distracting. Um, my father says a very similar thing. He's like, I didn't read Fez Ahmed Fez till I landed in Chicago. Yeah. Grad school with children, and yeah. when I was old enough. Um, our next question, topically enough, comes from Tanya Kureshi. Uh, and will be read by our very own Nick Bennett and has to do also with um, the question of writers and uh, references. So Nick. Hello. Yes, I am happy to read this on Tanya's behalf. The question is, are there any post-colonial theorists or texts that you would recommend for those that are interested in identity politics? Yes, please read Sadia Abbas, her book. We'll post um, these in the chat too. Yeah. So I think I shared a lot of links. So if you can like share those would be great. Sadi Abbas is an associate professor in the Department of English and Women's and Gender Studies at Rutgers University. And, yeah, she and she's written, she's, gra she's already finished that, but she did put out an incredible book on post-colonial, the predicament of post-colonial yeah. Islam. Aside from... Um, Professor Abbas, who else are the writers, thinkers that inform you? Like, I love hearing Adrian, Adrian. Yeah, well, you know, um, I was mentioning um, um, 
Pakistani poets uh, from either Riaz, but then with Slava Simborska poetry. Like for me, it's like really um, taking on a multiplicity of feminine female voices and finding, you know, again, a pattern within that, that language that resonates. And I think in that way, it really is a parallel in terms of drawing uh, iconographies that, uh, that can gain momentum and meaning when you uh, elaborate them in different combinations. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of a, a very sort of just like a basic method of how I develop iconographies is by creating these sort of juxtapositions. Then even, um, you know, very, very uh, different sort of uh, film, filmmaking, like uh, um, Kurosawa's uh, film, like understanding what that meant in terms of, again, the, you know, rep from outside of Japan and inside of Japan, how, how uh, identities formulate, how cultures occur, mm -hmm. how reception is, what is the inside, what is the outside in terms of, uh, in terms of like this sort of porosity of boundaries and, and um, the, uh, the feminist um, Rafia Zakaria, I have had the opportunity to uh, do conversations with her and do an interview with her. So oftentimes it's, um, it's people that I've had a uh, opportunity to actually work with or collaborate with or engage with over time that that has much more deeper meaningful resonance and that's how I usually um, move forward in in terms of my sort of practice the other artists like Damien Ortega's work I, I I've always liked his work I think we overlapped in Berlin when I was doing one of the residencies at the DAD. So, so it's very varied. Sazia, thank you. I'm, I'm entering abruptly because I have to go to another meeting, but- Hi, Fong. Thank you, Jason. It's terrific to hear this lengthy, um, in-depth conversation. And I just want to make a, a quick comment, just follow what you say there. I remember very clearly when I met, um, it was Saeed, pretty much right after Samuel Huntington uh, essay is called Clash of Civilization. Yeah. It's been published in the early 90s, I think 93, right after the end of the Cold War. And the idea is that the gimmicking of the war of the wars, you know, like instead of not separating the powerful and the powerless communities is so futile because Westerners, Muslims, and other people alike are all swimming in the, the ocean of history. I remember that very well, the way he phrased it so beautifully. So the idea is trying to identify with a certain specific niche in which you can discover yourself is a very condition that really tied to defensive cell pride rather than critical understanding of the, the widening independence of our, our time. And that's why when Orientalism was written in 78, it was essential to the understanding of it all. But anyway, you did that in your work, open it all up. You're not just a painter or an artist from Pakistan. You're trying to open up the dialogue and through the art process, you really create all, all kind of inquiry for the rest of those who view the world. And I think that's very important. And thank you, you guys. Need to go, but uh, we can continue. Can't wait to see you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I am so appreciative of, of being part of this incredible series. So yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me. We're so happy to have you. Um, on that thank you for the poet too. I need to go, but please. Uh, okay. Be grateful for our poet too. Thank you, you guys. Bye. Yes. Um, thank you to Fong, uh, our luminous publisher. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Shazia. Um, we had a lot of like comments coming in from like different alums and lovers of the drawing center, specifically Bushra Gill, 
who is in the audience, um, said she remembers when she first met you, how much they all loved your work. Michelle Laporte. Hi. You <laughs> she left this really cute comment. She said, thank you. It's been a dream. And she's been so inspired by you since 97. Huh. Um, I just wanted to shout that out. Um, <laughs> On that note, on the rail, at the rail, we've had a tradition of ending lunch with a poem. This is a tradition we used to practice when we were um, in the office all together in real life. And luckily we've been able to carry that practice into these community events. So today I'm thrilled to welcome the phenomenal poet, Zachary LaMalfa to the Zoom stage. Um, but before he gets on the Zoom stage, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Zachary LaMalfa is a poet and teacher from New Jersey. His poems and other writings, his poems and other writings have appeared in Pro Lit, The File, and Tinge, among others. He currently instructs courses in English and literature at the City University of New York. Zachary, you should be able to... Turn on your mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is it working? Oh, beautiful. Okay. Um, I was terrified there for a minute because a very loud truck parked right below my window could have blown the whole thing, but I guess we're good. Um, it, it's really a treat and a, a privilege to be here. I just want to thank real quick The Rail for having me. And this was, this was enlightening and, and wonderful. I took a, an incredible amount of illegible notes of a very compulsive nature. Um, <clears throat> In any way, uh, these are two very ordinary poems here. Uh, the first is called Love Song. People love to talk loudly in the street early in the morning over idling trucks. People love to talk loudly in the street and whistle in the morning sectioned off from night by expressway traffic, street lights where the stars are hiding, where bosses hide waiting to claim the morning in the name of immense productive potential. People love and hate a bus for showing up that presses toward the day on time. People Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Whether people love any of this, Saturday people and sometimes Sunday, we still have the morning everywhere and bosses still asleep, still whistling their own dream, dreamt every night of unlimited morning, delivery trucks and a little, a little room to sit on the bus. People love to talk loudly in the street and spit on it too, Appropriate salute, I salute it with you and rest my head a few minutes on the bus, which people love to do, their heads against the window while out the window, it stops being night gradually, then once and for all, love as ever has been the wrong word, though this one planet glitters, it is the bus and the bus is late. All right, and then I thought that this next one would be a little bit timely. Um, it's called Permanent Vacation. Everybody wants love. I want to be in Paris. Everybody is looking for a good time, but I would rather be in Paris. Everybody votes for love and a good time when all I want is an affair to carry on for two months and then torch, tear down, stay friends and have dinner in the ashes every other week, take all the books and lacquered beams from all the gondolas we stole and build a library. Who do I mean by everybody? Who knows, I would rather be in Paris setting fire to the furniture in a bank for love and a good time and everybody who wants love but finds it tied up in rent in the gas bill, distillery and packaging costs built into the price of a good time, a property tax on love transmitted to the pur purchaser of love, wood, dinner, books. But that's why you build a library however many months you want the weekend to last. That's why tunneling through the walls of row houses on the main streets could change everybody. You tear down the museum like you tear down the columns, like I changed everybody when I realized I didn't mean everybody in the first instance. Everybody together under the canvases of great paintings like big down blankets, where they become our shoes in the last instance, where the snow gets in, the situation flips. Everybody here posts pictures of the smoke. In Venice, there's snow, but in Paris, smoke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zachary. I feel like we should all catch that flying kiss. Um, and thank you so much, Jason. Thank you, especially Shazia. Um, 
And thank you everyone who came out today in the audience. Uh, please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a special tribute to Paul Kasmin with Elliot Phuket, Richard Armstrong, and David Notan, who will all be in conversation with our very own publisher and captain of this ship, Fang Rui. Um, that event will be, as always, at 1 p.m. Eastern right here in the Zoom. Uh, you should now be able to turn on your microphones and holler goodbye as you leave. Um, but thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. The bus thank is always you. late, Zachary. Thank you. Thank you. Zachary. Thank you, Shazia. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jason. Thanks to my parents for coming. <laughs> They're in there. Thanks, Ali. Uh, from Mexico. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mexico. What, what is David putting up there? I don't know. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you, Shazia. Thank you, okay. the Thank rail. You, you have to say goodbye to everyone since Fong is not here. Bye. Right, goodbye. <laughs> Thank Bye. you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Shazia.